<clears throat> good morning all i welcome you uh, to this morning session today we have the immense pleasure of having dr prakash kumar rathod uh, with us sir is an assistant professor at veterinary college bidar karnataka and the topic uh, of deliberation chosen by our resource person is good practices uh, for sustainable feed and fodder management in animal husbandry sir uh, your presentation is visible uh, please unmute yourself and please be if you want to be visible also you can turn on your camera and you can start sir please start and sir we have about 1 hour less than 1 hour for the presentation and 5 10 minutes uh, depending on how fast you finish for the q and a is it fine now yes yes you are audible uh, as well as uh, visible let's switch to uh, uh, our uh, ppt right. yes, yes yes start the uh, we have to allow uh, yeah uh, good morning all of you can you sir quickly okay, yeah yeah exactly thank you let's start sir yeah yeah uh, good morning and i thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, share some of my experiences about uh, good practices for sustainable feed and fodder management in animal husbandry so as we all know that major share or major investment with regards to the animal husbandry sector is all revolving around feed and fodder management and we know around 70 to 80% of the cost goes with the uh, feed and fodder management so this is actually in brief the role of livestock in integrated farming system where actually we are talking about organic system the cropping system and livestock and we know that each and every uh, unit is interlinked uh, that is what we are trying to depict here and we have uh, the bigger uh, contribution of livestock sector with regards to milk meat egg and uh, we have a major contributor uh, from the livestock sector with regards to doubling farmers income and you can uh, go through this particular table which makes it very clear that actually the role of uh, livestock is getting uh, improved uh, day by day and year by year actually as compared to agriculture as well as livestock sector because uh, I, we can say that livestock contributes almost up to 30% to agriculture GDP and all other sectors are contributing the remaining 70%. So with regards to, uh, because although we have uh, different uh, sectors working, we are actually seeing that actually extension sector needs to still work hard on this aspect because uh, extension, livestock extension especially is not taken so seriously as of uh, now or till date uh, because it is taken very sporadically casual or it is still occasional and has various issues with regards to the budget, human resource, infrastructure and uh, so on. And we have different agencies who are dealing with livestock extension. But when we say livestock extension, people still are not able to define what is livestock extension. And uh, we can see different organizations who are delivering these services. So we have the State Department of Animal Husbandry is the major stakeholder who is uh, actually the person to deal, or maybe I can say the agency to deal with livestock extension to a greater extent. But it has got its own constraints with regards to inadequate staff, poor budget liquid major concern and issue is actually still we are not able to make it clear that livestock extension what is uh, like should we is it going ahead with the clinical approach or actually do we have to talk only about training demonstrations because some states even uh, says that organizing an animal health camp is actually uh, extension activity and some states say that organizing animal health camp is actually a clinical department affair so uh, predominant observations what we could make out is actually we have uh, that yes. stuff for livestock sector focuses only on healthcare and breeding interventions so we know that most of our budget as well as activities are all revolving around healthcare as well as breeding interventions but the major focus we need to have is on feed and fodder management so interestingly we also have pointed out that in one of our studies we have pointed out that less than 10 percent of the budget is allotted sorry so we need to allot at least 10% of the budget for extension activities, but we see that hardly one less than 1% has been allotted by different states. So coming on to the, as we said, actually feed and fodder is a very important uh, entity for all of us. We are seeing that actually there is a deficit of uh, green fodder as well as dry fodder over the years. So from 1995, we had a deficit and this deficit is still continuing and we are not able to meet that uh, demand. Again, with regards to our crude protein and uh, TDL, so total digestible nutrients, here also we see there is a deficit of uh, the uh, crude protein and 
total digestive nutrients. So we have different constraints or issues with regards to feed-in for production, and we are also trying to have some strategies for feed-in for management, and we also need to have certain ongoing schemes and programs. So these are some of the important constraints that we have uh, noticed in different parts of uh, the country, I can say, because I am going to share some of my experiences with regards to uh, being in Karnataka as an assistant professor, as well as actually having some experience at working at ICRISAT, which is an international organization, wherein we could have some experience of working in Uttar Pradesh and uh, different states, Orissa, Maharashtra, and Karnataka. And in the same way, actually, I'm just, we can note, have different, these constraints, because it's a common constraint that even whole, maybe I can say the farmers of whole country are facing. So it is with regards to irregular supply of seeds, or they are having, they don't have knowledge, they do have not have much accessibility to inputs, there is scarcity of water, maybe lack of land, labor, and so many. Next, in this constraint, we need to have, uh, in this uh, issue, we need to have different strategies, and different strategies can be in terms of cost-effective concentrate or supplementary feed preparation, silage preparation, green fodder production, the chaffing of fodder, mineral mixtures. So we have a list of activities under feed and fodder management, but here, in my uh, presentation, I'm going to share some of the practices what we have followed in our uh, project areas are as well as actually in our nearby villages actually and that is what I'm going to share. When I say good practice, this is actually a process or a methodology that represents the most effective way of achieving a specific objective. See, I do not say that these practices are the only way of achieving the goals or the only way of achieving our objectives. But the point here is we need to understand that this may be a practice, good practice for us and what you people are following may be a good practice for you. Ultimately, we should understand that it is the way of working. So it is only a way of working, and I do not normally say that it is the best approach. Okay, so we have we can have our approaches depending on the situations, depending on the uh, uh, region where we are staying, region on the farm, depending on the social background of the farmers. And some of the examples we have is application of ICT, application like how to link farmers to the markets, how to have capacity building activities, the role of farmer organizations. These are different good practices we have, but I am going to focus mostly on feed and fodder management in animal husbandry. Firstly, I am going to take some of the examples or some of the experiences we had from a World Bank funded project that is a Karnataka Watershed Development Project. So it is also called as Sujala. Uh, it was the third. Uh, Third, actually, that's what we say. It's Sujala third program. So we had different partners in this. We have agriculture department, we have watershed department, we have irrigation, we have horticulture, we have veterinary university also. So that's what even veterinary university was involved here to look up for animal husbandry activities. And this uh, program, which was started in 2000, uh, December 2014, had uh, different uh, objectives, and it was implemented in totally 11 districts of Karnataka. And actually, I personally was handling. Uh, one of the district that is Bidar district and I'm going to share most of our experiences from Bidar district and later on I am also taking some experiences from uh, Uttar Pradesh where I was working as a uh, scientist and I am also giving some experiences from my PhD uh, experiences. So I was, we were working both basically in 14 villages and we had different approaches followed here. So the approaches was just to come up with initial the baseline survey. So we did a baseline survey. So very interestingly, we should understand that in all the baseline surveys, what we do, we this is the best practice we followed. Like we need to have certain critical gaps. So what we are seeing here is the population of livestock was most mostly with the desi cow and buffaloes. We have uh, extension to semi-intensive uh, system. There was only 2.68 liters per day. You see, the beaver normally is actually considered as a uh, dry belt, and it is having actually so many issues with regards to the rot. Uh, conditions and uh, even when you say actually people normally go fed the jawar straw and sugarcane tops and we did not find much fodder production in these particular uh, areas. So I am not talking about only about Bidar, we have the similar situations with regards to North Karnataka I can say. We have around almost 10 to 11 districts here where actually they face the similar problems. See with regards to health, with regards to housing, so this is all related to the component related to dairy. So in the same way, we have issues related to goat and sheep production, where we can see with regards to breed, the feeding system, 
it's mostly we are following the grazing system here the farmers are mostly revolving on uh, the grazing system and we have unregulated and unorganized markets so in this context what we could do is we could identify some gaps and have a certain identified interventions see when i say dairy production we say actually low productivity green fodder shortage water wastage or maybe i can say lengthy intercoming period so they are all actually gaps what we could object or uh, notice out of our pro uh, project baseline survey so based on that we could actually identify different interventions maybe with regards to promoting balanced feeding having green fodder availability promoting high yielding fodder varieties maybe enrichment of fodder silage making and in introducing chaff cutters so there are all different interventions what we could uh, introduce based on our critical gaps studies in the same way we have goat and sheep production systems wherein we could see actually in breeding poor kidding and winning rate there are actually different critical gaps and we could identify different interventions so based on our critical gaps and uh, interventions we have planned some of the activities or some of the interventions which we will be discussing one by one so i am trying to focus mostly on feed and fodder management because that is the topic assigned to me because we had different activities but still we will be here in my presentation i'll be focusing only on feed and fodder management so as we say actually always that the feed for livestock should have 60 to 70% of green fodder 20 to 30% rye fodder and 5 to 10% of concentrates or supplementary feed this is mostly not followed by most of our farmers so when when we, whenever we go to a farmer the farmer says that actually he is either feeding only green fodder when it is the rainy season or monsoon season and it when it comes to summer season he is mostly feeding the straw or the dry item so with this and very rarely they go for concentrated feeding and sometimes they give some grains and all but that is not going to give a correct combination of concentrated feed or supplemented feed so this is what we need to understand that we need to have a combination of green dry and supplementary feed so that we can have a better wheat yield as well as better fat and snf content so that the farmers can get better income so this is some of the uh, combinations we have got basically with regards to green fodder dry fodder the enrichment and different compositions so when we say actually green fodder this experience i am taking from our own project villages where we had like we had an idea of introducing legumes and non -legu legumes non legumes grass and fodder trees in the project villages so we had 14 villages and we initially started like it was very difficult for the for, difficult for the project team to convey the importance of the green fodder because farmers do not normally assign any land for green fodder so we asked them to assign some land on the bunds of the field or actually assign some land in the uh, in the corners of the field so idea was to have around two guntas so i can say around uh, so 40 guntas is actually one acre what we normally say so accordingly we wanted the farmer to have around at least five to six different varieties of farm fodder for their animals so this was the experience when we started somewhere in 2015 the farmers we it was very difficult for us to uh, identify the farmers and take it ahead so we can see here uh, green fodder in terms of uh, we have actually the our hybrid napier we have sesbenia which is a fodder tree we are using which is rich in legumes so we followed a different practices like we organized different awareness programs we developed different literature materials we had even visit from the farmers visit from different officers to this field and we try to regularly update or maybe we try to regularly meet the farmers and actually encourage them or motivate them to go for green fodder production so over a period of time we actually slowly started uh, the concept of uh, green fodder production and we can see different farmers started joining us and over a period you can see that farmers are actually cultivating the farmer uh, the fodder and actually they are even starting to distribute the fodder slips or i can say fodder root slips or some cases we had even distribution of fodder seeds so over a period of time this we could see but it was very difficult for the project team but ultimately we should understand that regular follow and uh, distribution of certain inputs will really help in uh, horizontal diffusion of this fodder production the farmers slowly started giving the seeds from one place to another place and from one farmer to another and over a period of time we could see that actually the farmers started getting benefits in terms of fodder production or maybe in terms of uh, distributing roots leaves we were not basically interested in selling the roots leaves or the seeds but we were interested to distribute these 
routes leads to other villages basically in the project area but later on actually we slowly starting started to focus on the distribution to other villages also and additional or any extra fodder was actually put in terms of silage making by the beneficiary farmers so we can see there is a horizontal diffusion and adoption of slowly over a period of time from 2015-16 so we could move ahead with 1890 and later on actually the due to some other uh, issues actually from 1890 the farmers slowly because of drought uh, actually some other personal issues they slowly the farmers could not continue with five or six varieties but they came down to only one or two varieties but this is actually what uh, the image what we are showing is basically for around five to six varieties of fodder but later on actually they restricted themselves to one or two varieties and uh, the farmers also got certain uh, social recognition maybe in terms of actually the newspaper coverage and all these uh, extension related publications next uh, component what we are discussing is about dry fodder enrichment and uh, this actually is another issue because we know most of the farmers whenever they grow any especially the sugar cane or actually when you go towards North India, we have a stubble burning as one of the issue. So we wanted the farmers to educate about the importance of uh, trash, sugarcane trash, and we asked them to. We demonstrated the importance of sugarcane trash, and uh, we normally ask them to. Hello, sir. Hello, Dr. Rathod. Hello. I think Sar has got disconnected. Let me call him. There is some internet issue. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, please stay on. There is some problem. Uh, the connectivity issue. So please, uh, participant, please uh, stay on. You will be back within uh, five minutes. <laughs> Majid, Majid sir, can you hear me? Dr. Majid. Yes, sir, I'm calling, I'm calling him. Yeah, yeah, please uh, connect him. He got disconnected, he got disconnected. Let me call him. He's not receiving, but let me call him again. Yeah, yeah, otherwise we'll make some alternative. So when the participants, by the time, uh, uh, till they come back, we'll just we have some discussions. Uh, yeah, there are uh, around one, uh, yeah, 110 members are uh, there today. Actually, uh, very less number uh, logging in. I want you to uh, attend the class properly. And if any questions you have, you can ask uh, at the end of the session. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay.
so yeah actually today we had class from uh, uh, the one professor from uh, bidar agriculture uh, veterinary university but i think uh, due to some connectivity issue uh, he is unable to uh, talk to you so i am just uh, uh, filling the gap so well uh, i think uh, you are all uh, enjoying the classes and uh, i think last uh, today given on assignment also i think uh, all of you completed i feel okay if any information anything you can uh, message or you can call hmm? so and one more thing is uh, we have passed upon you one uh, one form small form uh, related to your name then uh, address okay because this time uh, we use a uh, number of participants and there may be some uh, uh, spelling mistake and that that sort of the issues uh, that's why we passed one form small form you please collect and uh, fill it and send uh, uh, to us so that accordingly we can prepare uh, your uh, certificates okay <coughs> yeah because here there are two issues one is a plant nutrition and another is animal nutrition so once uh, i feel who are all interested in plant nutrition uh, they may not attend the animal nutrition part and who are all the interested in animal nutrition they are not attending the plant nutrition part i feel so and uh, of course uh, uh, yeah nearly 115 numbers are logged in amar yeah so you can you can uh, ask any questions if you how you can ask at the end no problem hmm? Uh, because uh, the training is always uh, the two way communication you can discuss you can uh, ask questions doctor, yes sir yeah please tell me dr kishan hello for assignment for assignment sir yeah uh, plant nutrition and animal nutrition sir which one we have to write sir both are either one sir any one any one we have given one, option sir. ಪ್ರಕಾಶ್ ರಾಥೋಡ್ Yeah, I think he will continue now within two, five minutes. Dr. Prakash Rathod, are you online? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. He is, he is. Sir, continue, yeah, yeah. sir, continue. He can continue, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay, Dr. Sir, thank you. Sir, can you press the hide at the bottom? Yes, sir. You can start, sir. You can continue. ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಪ್ರಕಾಶ್ ಸರ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಯು ಸೇ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಎಸ್ ಸರ್ ಯಾ ಯಾ ಪ್ರಕಾಶ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ can you uh, unmute yourself please continue sir yeah thank you so we all know know that actually whenever we have this uh, excess green fodder with us we can go for silage making so that this silage can be used in terms whenever we have a lean season so today actually we have a rainy season and you can have green fodder and you can uh, store it as a silage and then you can use it maybe in the month of february march or maybe april whenever you have uh, a shortage of green fodder so this is actually the concept and we normally introduce even the silage making for the farmers we demonstrated and you can see some of the farmers who have prepared a silage and these bags were also provided to the farmers because 
one way actually we need to give some inputs for the farmers so that they can take up take it up very voluntarily so we actually give fodder seeds to the farmers we give technical inputs to the farmers and then actually they could they could grow green fodder and then we could even demonstrate the about silage making so this is how it is uh, worked out now we can see the silage making in a bigger numbers where actually if you have a less number of animals you can make it in a water barrel or water container and nowadays the bags of 100 kg 200 kg and 500 kg are also available you can have a silage done in a pit so we can see how the farmers are actually doing it and this is how actually it has become a very uh, entrepreneurial model now so if you have a time maybe you can google it uh, so cornex silage is an uh, organization or a private company which is working on silage making so they are preparing bales of silage they procure the green fodder from farmers and they have all the machineries and all those things and they are normally preparing silage in a very high quantity so this is how actually uh, it is being introduced across uh, the country now and next point is with regards to area specific mineral mixture we know actually the mineral mixtures are very important for the farmers and uh, we also know that there are different soils which have uh, maybe maybe i can say actually lacunae or maybe have they have very lesser quantity or deficient they are deficient in naturally different minerals so in that context not to fulfill this we need to go for mineral mixture feeding and this mineral mixture of hardly uh, 25 to 50 gram is very much helpful for the farmers with regard to productive as well as to reproductive life cycles in the same way we say actually uh, most of the farmers uh, there are actually very uh, less number of farmers who understand the importance of fodder chaffing see we actually see in, when you go towards haryana and punjab where i did my even uh, phd studies we could see actually farmers are feeding the animals after chaffing but in terms of in north karnataka whenever we go through this we do not normally find this and very less number of farmers are have chaffing their fodder and feeding this itself will actually solve 50 to 60% of the problem so chaffing itself can solve most of the problems so we can improve our feed palatability as well as improves the remuneration time so next we all we, we have also tried to encourage farmers with regard to tree fodder cultivation so we uh, this is because going to be very helpful you can take some trees or fodder trees on the bunds so that actually uh, the farmers need not have any issues with regards to the uh, bunds or actually the flow with regards to water and all these issues can also be sorted out apart from giving green fodder to the animals so we can have subabul we can have drumstick glycidia there are all different uh, fodder trees we can use basically on the bunds other actually or else give certain land for the uh, growing of these fodder trees so apart from this uh, we had actually very little experience of using unconventional feed resources but what we had experience basically with regards to green fodder production silage making the enrichment and mineral mixture feeding so this and uh, as well as fodder uh, cultivation for a tree cultivation but this is actually how even uh, nowadays we can talk about unconventional feed resources how farmers can use it spineless cactus has been actually taking a new future in india because wherever we have a dry belt wherever there is a very acute shortage of water you can go for spineless cactus as a feed and fodder so some of our experiences are actually put in terms of uh, different uh, literatures so there's an organization we have agriculture extension south asia wherein we are trying to focus our uh, work in terms of uh, writing them up in those uh, different literatures so in, in actually when i was a part of ecrisat as a visiting scientist actually i had some experience of working with regards to spent malt feeding even in uttar pradesh in haryana as well as punjab so we see this that spent malt people are feeding spent malt uh, to their animals and but very important thing we need to know is actually we need to have a better education for the farmers although this can replace concentrate feeds so we know that this is giving a better concept uh, fruit protein fruit fiber and but we should understand that we should not feed more than 10 to 15% of diet or maybe 1 kg per 100 kg of body weight so apart from that we also need to understand that we need to feed it within 24 to 36 hours or else because since it is mostly having higher moisture content higher water content this may even uh, cause some health issues for the animals so that is why we need to see that it is regularly fed up to 1 kg per 100 uh, kg of body weight but preferably within time so this improves uh, milk yield and nowadays actually people are having a different methods of feeding it we have direct we have ensiling it or we can feed even dry so the problem most of the times we see is actually farmers need to feed within 24 to 36 hours or else they may face different problems 
So when we had actually an experience of working in Bundelkhand region of Uttar Pradesh, Bundelkhand region, most of us know that it is actually a very uh, has a acute dry, we say acute drought condition, and we also had to have a certain uh, plans or activities introduced. And we have a very strange practice called Annaprata, where actually uh, they have a stray cattle, and actually we have a large fallow land. So we also need, we also had different activities here. And uh, there actually we introduced different fodder systems. So we were working basically in 20 villages of seven districts of Bundelkhand. So we had uh, different components with regards to the fodder production. We always encourage the farmer to have legume and non-legume combinations as well apart from fodder trees. So we in Karif season we had legume uh, kaupi and we had actually sorghum koi for 31 apart from having sespini and subo. So we can see different uh, total quantity the farmers received and total area under fodder cultivation. The very issue here is many times we can see actually in one of the image uh, there is actually sorghum fodder CHS 24 mm MF actually at Jalon village where actually uh, it has grown to such a height and scientists of IGFRI institutes like BF, BF they were all actually partners with ICRISAT for introducing these type of interventions. Next, in Rabi season, we can see actually the farmers very happy, very happy with Barsim as the legume and oat as the uh, non-legume. So Barsim we had provided uh, the Ordan and we can see different quantities in different districts of uh, Bundelkhand. So even we had implemented crop cutting experiments with regards to green fodder. Because this is not the uh, practice we normally follow for fodder. But we normally follow this crop cutting experiments only with regards to the other crops but even in our project villages where first time the farmers introduced and they were very happy with the Barsim and we could even see that farmers were selling Barsim uh, in the markets so uh, they were almost earning the uh, earning by selling actually the Barsim crop in the uh, markets local markets so this is all actually what we discussed is all about uh, the large animals or large ruminants but now we are again going ahead with discussion for the small ruminants so we had some of the experiences with even feeding of goats feeding of feeding of goats and we mostly focused on the transition period see when i say transition period so it is actually the last two months of uh, kidding and almost two months after kidding so we are covering trying to cover our around three to four months of period for the pregnant goats so this normally has improved uh, it improves improves kidding percentage and it normally gets low mortality as we know actually in case of goats the kids almost the mortality of kids is almost 25 to 30 percent in uh, the initial one to two weeks so we have even tried to reduce the mortality and there was improvement in the mean birth weight of the kids and uh, health of the health or body condition score of mother as well as the uh, kids was also good and there was increased milk yield in dough so this is what basically we did was actually through the and there was increase in the twinning and prepared percentage also so this is a combination we had basically uh, actually we discussed in con consultation with the animal nutritionists and we prepared this feed this we did this we did even in Karnataka different districts of Karnataka and later on we have also introduced this in Uttar Pradesh so this is the formula basically we can have the first combination or as even at farmers level you can have a second combination also so we can feed around 50 gram to 300 grams <coughs> daily in two split quantities and the raw materials are also actually mentioned here so that if somebody is interested can have it so we could see actually uh, we could see a lesser number of uh, mortality and improvement in the birth weight of kids so we always went for see once you distribute the feed <coughs> to the animals uh, to the sorry to the farmers the farmers are asked to feed the animals and every 15 days we used to go to the farmer and actually see the weight of the mother and if there was any kidding see the weight of the kids also because what we normally see is this is not the practice followed by the farmers we only see that farmers are following the grazing practices but through this method we could see a very great improvement in the health of the animal and with regards to even the sale of the animal so at a very young age, if the animals start getting a better age, a better weight, so normally at the age of seven to eight months, they could normally get almost 15 to 20 kgs, which they had. The farmers were very happy, and this is actually we did all through the participatory action research because we involved the farmers. This is only a small study which is taken 
and I just put the screens of some of the paper what I published. But we did this exercise in Karnataka, we did this in different districts of Karnataka as well as in the Bundelkhand region of Uttar Pradesh. So this is actually where we did with regards to the uh, Bundelkhand region of Uttar Pradesh where actually farmers were also happy and different experts were also very happy with the, this exercise. Next, we need to know how this is actually some of the experiences we had directly with regards to implementing these activities. But apart from this, we also need to know about different uh, public private partnerships in feed and fodder production. So I am again giving some examples because whenever we talk about public private partnership, this is normally used in different fields, but very rarely for uh, the feed and fodder sector. I am giving some examples from Tanuas, that's uh, Tamil Nadu uh, Veterinary University. Wherein actually this, you can see that uh, this was actually a cutting from 2012, where we say that actually farmers or the university has tied up with the farmers for uh, procuring the fodder seeds. So this story actually has built up to such a great extent that today you can see almost more number of farmers. I will give uh, the data again because 126 farmers actually have procured the fodder seeds from the uh, university that actually KVK Shivjan Kira Namakal has been greatly involved in this and they have received the foundation fodder seeds and these fodder uh, these fodder seeds have been sown with the farmers and farmers have developed the fodder seeds and they have actually given back the uh, fodder seeds this is actually an example of buyback mechanism where actually we know that fodder seeds do not have a much market but still when a university is purchasing it the farmers will be very happy to get these for the university is getting the fodder seeds, the farmers are getting a good price for these fodder seeds and the university is later on packing it, packing it and giving supplying to different maybe farmers or different governments or actually many other uh, fodder cooperatives and all, sorry, uh, dairy cooperatives and all other places. So you can see the experience of uh, Namakkal KVK where actually they are coordinating the producers or the farmers as well with the buyers. So the KVK is actually giving technical guidance, giving training on different aspects of production and monitoring and producer, the farmers are actually uh, getting the foundation fodder seeds and then they are developing the seeds and then they are giving it back to KVK and the KVK is packing it and uh, giving a good shape in the name of university and it is selling it to different government organizations and different farmers. See on average actually 20 to 25 tons of seeds is being uh, procured from by from the farmers by this KVK and from 2011 to March 2020 almost more than 1 lakh I can say up to 2 lakh kgs of fodder seeds has been procured so and we can say totally almost 1.5 lakhs farmers have been supported or have been benefited through this program so this is how actually the farmers can also be in, involved or included basically with regards to having this experience even we can see seed supplied as well as actual seed sale sold so from for the period of 2013 to 20. So for more details you can we can even go through the <coughs> website of IV and Namakal KVK where actually we can have a better <coughs> detailed experience. I'm just uh, trying to focus on we have actually different schemes I'm just giving an example of Tamil Nadu uh, state of water development scheme in this way actually almost all the states have their own uh, programs we have Karnataka, we have Maharashtra different states are giving different types of support for the farmers but what, what we should understand is how many farmers are really having this land for growing the fodder how many of them are really having an experience of growing this fodder are they do, do they really have a knowledge and we also see different silage banks bags being sold do they really have access green fodder for making silage or for preparing silage how best is this azola unit so I'm, I may be showing only an example of Tamil Nadu here, but we should understand that this is applicable for all the <coughs> states. We have central government schemes, we have state government schemes, but we need to see that actually how best it, is, it can be implemented at field level. Because the veterinary officers or actually the state department of animal husbandry have their own issues, maybe with regards to the shortage of human resource, maybe with regards to lack of extension activities, but we need to see that actually these programs can be worked out successfully. In the same way, actually almost all the states have got their own fodder production units. So depart, they have the department farms and we need to see that actually these department farms are well established and actually they have a good model for <coughs> interacting with the farmers and have <coughs> better fodder production. Nowadays, we are also trying to even 
uh, distributed chaff cutters, maybe manual or maybe electrical. Okay, all these actually are having a different a positive as well as actually negative experiences. So it's not the case of Tamil Nadu. It is actually, I'm just trying to depict Tamil Nadu here, but we are talking about the whole country as a whole. So apart from this, I'm just trying to share an experience of Maharashtra. Varda is actually another district which is uh, in uh, which is nearby Nagpur. Okay, so where we say that actually uh, that also is having a drought issue, drought based issue. But when we normally take this example, we can say that a uh, veterinary officer himself actually has established a green fodder unit. That's that's called as called as fodder cafeteria, and this was actually started in the year 2015. Sorry. And initially it started in 2014 okay and then in 2015 and then later on actually it was moved and in order to actually encourage the farmers initially the photo seeds were sold free of cost later on actually it was sold on a very nominal revenue so mostly we had uh, a range for actually for production and up to we have 20 different varieties of fodder and this fodder cafeteria was basically established by a veterinary officer maybe you we call him as less development officer or some states they call it as Veteran assistant surgeon. So they had some a plot with uh, connected with their <coughs> veteran hospital. So they had around three acres of land connected with their veteran hospital, and this is how actually they have done. So different experiences can be considered. So this is actually a case of Ankara, which is actually a private organization. So that's an NGO basically, and they have worked on Acacia. So although we have moved ahead with different fodder varieties, but we should not forget our local or traditional fodder varieties. Acacia is one such example where actually we could, uh, where actually farmers can feed acacia to the uh, animals, especially the small ruminants, prefer this acacia nilotica as a fodder. This actually, there are some of the experiences what I'm trying to give is all from the different fields, different uh, where I'm directly and indirectly connected. And uh, we should also understand that ICT nowadays is directly or indirectly connected with fodder development. See, we say although we say ICT has got its role in almost all the fields, so we should see that how ICTs are trying to share, grow actually to a greater extent. We, uh, the university, our own university, has got different literatures on working on a fodder, so in local language or as well as actually in English. And we should also see that different organizations like we have. Feedipedia, which is given by actually FAO, and we have actually IGFRI, which has developed a Chara app, and uh, actually Ecreset also developed a small booklet, and which is also available online, basically on different fodder production aspects, and different fodders are being covered actually here, legumes, non-legumes, as well as actually fodders on field burns and degraded lands. It's around 60 pages, a book booklet. And uh, when we have all these aspects, uh, ultimately I come to this uh, basic concept called livestock innovation system or fodder innovation system. We need to identify farmers or farmers organization for growing fodder for all of us. And so that actually lot, later on, this is being supported by NGOs or private organizations. We need to have uh, the collaboration, or I say actually, we need to have uh, better coordination among input industry supply we need to have marketing, we need to have research because we need to have a research not to say that this particular field or sorry, variety is suitable for this particular area. In the same way, extension and information is important, support later on processing and storage, logistics. All these facilities are ultimately important for all of us so that we can promote fodder innovation system. So this is a way of actually generating the ideas and, and later on actually modifying the active ideas or modifying the activities depending on the requirements so that we all can learn and we all can promote better. So that is all uh, with regards to the innovation coordination system and some of the experiences we have got. Although it was actually, I had only 40 to 45 minutes of time, so I had to move uh, very fast in this regard. So we need to understand that with regards to the green fodder production or maybe fodder feed and fodder management, we have we need to focus on production to market and extension because it's not only growing green fodder or growing actually the feed we are manufacturing feed we also need to find different markets for the fodder or markets for the feed in the same way we also need to have we need to focus on region based practices so we need to understand dry land we need to understand about hilly areas which fodder seed is suitable for which area and which feed we can prepare and what are the best or uh, locally available resources available with the farmers so that we can prepare 
feed at the farmer's conditions and different fodder seeds or different feed for the based on the species we have we have cattle sheep goat buffaloes <coughs> we need to understand different need based and relevant technologies or practices and climate resilient uh, varieties because we know that actually some varieties consume more water and some are actually dependent on irrigated system and some are actually rain fed systems so based on all that we need to understand and today people are also talking about organic livestock farming so when you say that actually your milk is organic we should also understand that our grain fodder or our feed should also be organic so that is how actually even the organic feed or organic fodder is also having a greater demand later on with this all grain fodder production and feed and fodder management practices we can even think of value addition because having uh, resources like maize having resources like groundnut cake these all can be clubbed together and have a different unit we can have a different units so you can spend very little maybe up to 1 lakh or 2 lakhs so that you can prepare your own feed so this involves a very less machineries like we need to have a grinder we need to have a mixer so that we can have 100 kg or 200 kg of feed prepared and in the market nowadays we see actually a feed is costing around 25 rupees to 30 rupees per kg and if we can prepare it at our own uh, home it's coming around 17 to 20 rupees per kg so we can save a lot you by uh, doing this but only thing you need to understand is the resources what is available with us and resources what we can procure at a very cheaper cost so this is going to be really helpful for the farmers or for the extension officers so we have actually a greater scope or we can i give it is a very general a slide because i'm not focusing here for feed and fodder because we need to understand that through feed and fodder management we can promote small scale farmers we have a tremendous scope for farm diversification we can even think of integrated farming we need to talk when you have a better uh, feed and fodder management you will have a better milk yield maybe improvement in fat retention content so that we can think of value addition so ultimately we need to focus on export potentials even because it's not only for the domestic markets we need to think of our export markets also so i to conclude i would like to just put it as animal husbandry sector has a greater scope and uh, i also told you in initial even uh, initial period that there is no single or specific strategy but we need to understand the pluralistic pluralistic approaches that's what i told it, what i have followed may not be a good practice for you but you need to plan your own good practices that is important so over a period of time actually i learned that this is a very good way of working it out so in the same way maybe if you have your own practices what you have followed that can be a good practice so ultimately we need to understand that we need to promote a better innovation system by following and putting different coordinators or under the cooperation of different resource people or different agencies only individual organization or only farmers cannot have a better success but we need to understand that all together we can have a better systems so we have ict we have actually the public private partnerships we have farmer led extension we have farmer associations so there can be a better uh, suitable solutions for all of us in future maybe with regards to feed and fodder management so the presentation actually since we had actually hardly 40 minutes of time but it 45 minutes i have gone a bit fast but if there are any queries or if there are any personal discussions i am open for it and uh, with this i conclude and uh, i thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity so any questions uh, comments or suggestions are open thank you hello sir hello hello uh, do do you have any questions please ask i think i was bit fast no no we are perfectly in time we can have a q and a session okay no because no, i, I feel so that's why yes, Uh, any questions please ask right now
there is one question in chat sir if you look uh, what are the key <coughs> problems faced by farmers for silage making uh, yeah actually uh, with regards to this question silage making basically is uh, done in a situation where there is excess green fodder because what happens is many of the times we the government is promoting green fodder or maybe the silage making uh, but we do not the government even many times do not know actually how many farmers have excess green fodder the issue here is if you have excess green fodder then you have to go for silage making if you do not have excess then we do not need silage and next thing is if you can even prepare silage you can keep it or you can feed the animals in lean season just as i told you that if i have excess green fodder today and maybe in the summer season i may not be having rain and i may not be having green fodder so i can prepare it and keep it there the only thing is the issue with regards to the handling of green fodder and issue with regards to preparing silage there are different methods of preparing silage you can have bags you can have actually pit method you can have tower silos different methods are there but the only thing is how best the farmers feel it is good at their conditions is very important and once you open the silage bags after <clears throat> after 21 days we should understand that it is going we need to feed the animal how much is required and again pack it up and keep it so we can start using the silage from one side i uh, use some polythene sheet like that and actually as you use it then again you have to close it back so that is how actually it works <clears throat> so this is actually uh, these are some of the issues with uh, silage making there is one more question at the bottom yeah how much silage kg uh, can be given maximum quantity to a dairy animal see silage actually can be given as a green fodder silage is nothing but a green fodder as i already told you like if i give an example of uh, in in brief if i say if you are feeding 10 kg of fodder to an animal just an example so in this 10 kg is you can you need to have 6 to 7 kg of green fodder i can say even 6 kg of green fodder so that green fodder is nothing but silage because silage is not going to uh, it's, it's it's just as good as a green fodder so then we need to have 3 kg of 3 kg of uh, dry fodder and around 1 kg is for your concentrate feed so this is how you can calculate so this is actually even for a 400 kg of animal hardly it goes around 15 to 20 kg so it's as good as a green fodder so you can go up to 15 to 20 kg depending on the animal and i can see the question it is for 400 kg it's around 20 kg any other question you might have please ask me sir i think you will be sharing this presentation to all majid sir sir uh, uh, you can uh, email it to me on the same email i'll be making it part of the youtube video as well okay fine sir i will send it uh, yeah there is one more question at the bottom uh, yeah actually uh, it is uh, with regards to the animal what they are asking me, is there any adverse effects see normally what happens is any feed you give to a higher quantity to a more quantity normally will cause high adverse effects so the issue here is actually if your silage is not well maintained see for example that's what i was saying <clears throat> you should maintain the for 20 like uh, you need to maintain this silage in air tight conditions as well as under actually water tight conditions so if there is any problem with the moisture content and if your silage is not well maintained then actually there might be issue with aflatoxin content as well as some other uh, issues so that is how actually uh, we need to see that and if it is well maintained as per the technical aspects there is there will not be any problem and you can feed silage and uh, for some actually like there is a question with regards to 40 kg silage you need to go through <coughs> the requirement of the animal it is not actually like how much there is always an end point for feeding and i see even many times the farmers uh, the farmers feed even up to 8 8 kg 10 kg of concentrate feeds we need to understand that the maximum limit you can go is around 4 to 5 kg for concentrates and you can hardly go to 20 to 25 kg of silage because you need to have silage along with your 
you need you still have dry fodder to be fed you still have concentrated feeds to be fed it's not a silage only to be fed you need to have dry green and concentrates to be fed for the animals i can see another uh, question with regards to bravers green feeding as of now actually we <coughs> there are actually some of the studies which have undergone with regards to braver speed that's what we say about spent malt feeding this also has a similar problem because i said already that you procure it from some industries or from factories and you normally have to feed it within 24 to 36 hours if you try to keep it for higher period this also will have a similar issues just i was explaining for aflatoxin or actually maybe of mycotoxins and all so because it is very high in moisture content so we need to uh, look at that point also so in that context we need to even uh, bother uh, like uh, think of feeding it and apart from that we need to feed it hardly 1 kg of 1 kg per 100 kg of body weight so we cannot feed it more so this also will cause similar health problems if you are feeding more so anything else Okay, Majid sir, I'll be sharing my presentation. There is one more question, sir. What about uh, about cl uh, clamp silos? Actually, clamp silos actually is a new method nowadays. We have basically, anyways, I can discuss with this uh, later on also, uh, because mostly what we use with the farmers is all with mostly the bag silos as well as the pit silos. So clamp silo is actually having certain uh, materials or maybe I can say some resources so that you can. uh prepare silos so that is actually uh, clam silos but maybe more details a nutritionist can give it so as of now that is uh okay sir okay uh, uh if there are no further questions we can consider this session to be concluded uh, are there any questions please ask or uh, we'll consider this session to be concluded yes sir it is just making some uh, sort of clamps like that for actually uh, silage making so that is actually we use whole wheat and uh, other whole crops and you prepare just like some uh, bales like that and you prepare it and that's actually some machines involved basically with uh, making this and that's what we normally use it as clamp silos okay thank you sir in whole crop basically for uh, clamps but in in other types of silos we normally chaff it off chaff it to around 1 or 2 inches and then make silage but in clamp we normally use the whole crops basically thank you sir on behalf of the participants and on behalf of the uh, organizing committee and organizing members please uh, a, a great thank you to you for this interactive session uh, and a lovely presentation i uh, will be waiting for your presentation sir and i'll be making it part of the youtube uh, channel which we have thank you sir sure. thanks a lot sure sir thank you for the opportunity sir thank you participants you can subscribe to the channel the link i have already shared you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon so that whenever we post a new video it gets uploaded and you get a notification on your phone or other devices so every time we post a new video you get a, uh, you get a notification that way you can uh, that channel is called as kashmir hunt official to so please uh, subscribe to the channel kashmir hunt official i'll again post the link so that you could click it uh, and uh, subscribe that would be great if you subscribe thank you we may all join back at 2:30 thank you thank you yeah